Hi, this is Scott Bradfield. This is uh, the special 100th episode of uh, of the bathtub, uh, reading great books in the bathtub. So I pl I planned some special things. So first of all, I've got a candle. So this is like our our candle, and that just to say that this is our 100th episode. And who whoever would have thought, uh, you know, 35 years ago when I started this. This whole series in a, a 5,000 watt radio station in uh, Fresno, California, that it would take off and become such an international sensation. And uh, I mean, 35 years ago, I only had two viewers. The, the best thing about doing these talks has begun be, been the incredible um, uh, improvement in the quality of my my viewers. I started off with terrible viewers. Uh, my first two viewers. I only had two characters who used to watch these videos. One was a big fat guy with a bassoon and a beard who used to tell me, like, you know, he used to say, uh, tell me, send me things like, uh, let me give you a few tips, Sonny. You literally so say things like Sonny about how to give lectures. And the other one spent his time telling about how his mother was friends with Vladimir Nabokov and knew how to pronounce his name better than I did. Those are my only viewers. And since then, I now have dozens of people all over the, the world reading unproductively. And I can say this of all my viewers I, I speak to and, and, and correspond with, you are all doing a terrible job of studying literature. You're doing awful. You, you haven't learned anything. None of you could pass a single PhD exam, let alone an MA exam, let alone a freshman comp exam. You're doing terrible. You're reading the wrong translations. You're, mis you're mispronouncing things. You're reading science fiction and detective novels. You're, 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 not, you're not bowing down to uh, Ulysses. You're doing a terrible job, and I'm very proud of all of you. Thank you very much for, for sticking with me. And uh, I know these these are um, basically to keep me from uh, – these are basically the whole series is designed to keep me out of trouble, and that's the only reason we do it. So I, I, got, I brought a, a special cocktail. This is Cointreau chocolate cocktail, and I was going to actually drink it as a joke, but actually I'll make a mess with this. I'm not going to do it. So today um, – so uh, ha happy 100th birthday to myself, 100th episode. I'm going to blow this. I'm going to keep that going. I take that back. Now, I also brought a lot of stuff in here. Um, I did something I don't normally do, which is brought a lot of visual aids. As you, If you remember from the show from back when it was in Fresno 25, 30 years ago, we had no production values. We had no budget. Now I can call, summon this stuff up from the, you know, from the archives anytime I need it. And I brought in a lot of plastic flowers. That's a live orchid, my wife's orchids. And this lovely candle. I think you really got to see the whole dealy bot. I don't think you can really see any of this properly. But uh, let me see if I can put this somewhere you can actually see it. And without setting fire to the plant or myself. And uh, the reason I'm doing this is that we're going to talk today about one of my, some of my favorite literature and this is sort of literature like you study might study in, in college but we're going to try to avoid saying anything interesting anything important about any of it and what we're talking about today is something called and I can't I'm pronouncing it wrong l'art pour l'art it's art for uh, art uh, for art's sake and it was the uh, a period of literary um, interests uh, that I enjoyed when I was taking college. The first time I, when I was in as undergraduate school, I started reading people like Oscar Wilde and uh, Beardsley and the old Yellow Book and, and the stuff that was kind of fermenting in, in uh, all over England in the 19th, 19th century, early 20th century. And we're talking about Arthur Mackin. We'll uh, we talk about him more and more. He kind of comes out of that movement. And it was a sort of interest, art for art's sake, writing beautifully, writing stories and producing art that was not morally good. It didn't teach you anything about multiculturalism or how to build a proper society. It was just really kind of selfish, uh, so often flamboyant, often. And that's why I got this, my flamboyant part. This is my as close as I could get to being like a dandy in the, in the 19th century. So, um, so that's what all this is about. Oscar Wilde, of course, see, I brought a lot of visual aids, was the kind of reigning kingpin in the 19th century, still is great reading in the bathtub. You, you will laugh your head off reading uh, Portrait of Dorian Gray or reading any of his plays. Um, some of my favorite artists comes out of that period, Whistler. Uh, I can't 
I can't really get to the book, but this is a couple of examples of Whistler and some of the influence of the of the. Uh, they also called the decadent period because because they were um, they were decadent. They were just they're at the end of culture. They didn't care about anything but themselves. One of the other most famous ones was Beardsley. This is a bit beat up. There's Beardsley. See, this is I'm trying to do an impression of these characters. Uh, Max Beerbaum, the Max Beerbaum wrote some very funny stuff. He was part of that group, and he wrote a really funny novel, the name of which I've already forgotten. And he did all these weird, often erotic and dirty uh, pictures. And he illustrated all sorts of books of the time, including the um, Arthur Mackett's first book, the um, the um, God, the Great God Pan. And so I'm doing all of that just really to get to the point of uh, what I read in the bathtub this week, which was uh, Wiesmann. Again, I'm pronouncing it wrong, probably. Wiesmann's uh, Against Nature al Rebour. And it's, again, I'm just, I mean, this sounds like I'm, I promise I'll stop. I, I'm not really teaching you anything. But it was the book that influenced all of these writers a great deal. And one of the things that interests me the most about that period is how a number of very what we call naturalistic writers, writers who really like Zola, uh, who dug into the kind of reality of their neighborhoods and the people they knew and the social issues of their time, and how out of this intense interest in the reality of the world kind of flowered this incredibly unreal fiction and literature. And it's really interesting to me that Wiesmann was one of Zola's uh, confederates, one of his, his group uh, of committed naturalists. And when he writes against nature, he kind of turns his back on all of that stuff, or he takes it all and turns it up such a notch that you just take off from the planet altogether. Um, the other one, there was one of the book I had here I wanted to talk about, but I don't know where I put it. But Flaubert was a big influence on people like this. Gautier, we're going to do him. I'm pronouncing it again, Theophile Gautier. I love his stuff. Um, he did all sorts of weird, exotic, arabesque, uh, fantastic and sometimes fantasy novels, as well as sort of realistic uh, Madame Bovary type of, of uh, social social novels. So anyway, this is a long way of getting to uh, Al Rebour, and the premise of this book is it's about a guy who's kind of a rich dandy, like I am, like I'm playing on TV, and he he's a really wealthy man. His name is, um, I can't pronounce it, Duke Jean Floresac. Des Essent. I'm sure I've said that totally wrong. Don't write me. Um, anyway, this guy's a duke. He's, he's a nobility. He has all his money. He spent his life wasting his life just spoiling himself. And the whole thing about the, this kind of uh, art for art's sake period is just to, the purpose of art is pleasure. Is you know they have much nicer bathtubs. They have huge bathtubs filled with uh, aromas and perfumes. And this guy has given up on life. I maybe take this off because probably maybe maybe sending the wrong signal or something for the for the uh, the bathtub viewers. But uh, uh, he he. Uh, he, he's the character wants to get away from the world. The world, in this whole sense, is kind of tawdry and, and stained and unbeautiful and just not worth being in. And so he goes off and, and develops this kind of total privacy. He goes off into his castle, and he just wants to have beautiful things and cut himself off from the ugliness of society and life. So that's really basically the premise of the book. It, I was thinking what this is almost in many ways. It's kind of... It's kind of like Dracula without vampires. So there's no vampirism in it. There's no real magic in it, as I recall. There's no uh, supernatural events, and there's no there's no good guys and bad, and there's no beautiful, you know, buxom, mini, mina Hark Harknesses types running around needing to be saved. There's just this kind of kind of creepy, selfish man living in a castle trying to enjoy himself. And we basically go through all these series of kind of private adventures that he goes through. Um, for example, at one point, he, he wants he, he looks at, he's looking over this house. He just wants to make the place beautiful for himself, and he thinks the carpets are kind of dull. So he gets a big giant tortoise, and he decides to cover it over with jewelry and gold plating to make it sparkle, so that when it moves around on the carpets, it just sparkles. Uh, that's just one. There's one section where he's just um, he's. He's drinking symphonies, so there's lots of synesthesia, lots of kind of cross-sensory stuff. And, and the prose is like 
Wilde, who's really, Wilde called this the most unusual book he ever read. And it, it was a huge influence on him, and it's a huge influence on, on a much better book, which is um, Portrait of Dorian Gray. But it's still quite well written in translation. It, it's, it's kind of beautifully put together. Uh, so he experiments with, with liquors, and he experiments with perfumes. There's one whole chapter of perfumes. He's very interested in, like a lot of these characters, comes out of Catholicism, and he's a Jesuit student, as I recall, and he's really fascinated by the history of the Catholic Church and the hypocrisy of it, and then the beauty and splendor of all of this stuff. So he's often reflecting on that. And basically, it's a novel of a guy. He doesn't go out sucking people's blood, though. He does do a few nasty things. Uh, at one point, he uh, he meets some young boys. He's clearly got a, uh, you know, he's, he's, um, he's got a... a Multi, he's got various interests in men and women sexually, and he sees a young boy on the street, and he decides he wants to spoil this kid by buying him lots of clothes and making him live a life beyond his 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 means to see if he can make the kid evil. We never find out if he did or not, but he just he, he's experimenting randomly with human beings. Um, at another point, he's reflecting on his sexual adventures as a young man. One of his adventures, some parts of the book are very funny is he goes to a circus. I mean, he's had he's exhausted by all the sex of his life. And he's had so much sex, he just doesn't, uh, you know, he's he, he trying to find new sensations. So he has a relationship with a giant, a big uh, acrobat, this woman who's a big acrobat. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't quite understand that part. But the other part is after the acrobat thing wears off, he, he, he gets a ventriloquist. He meets a ventriloquist from the same circus, and he decides to have sexual relationships with this woman. And one of the things he loves doing is having her throw her voice as if she's her own husband outside trying to pound down the doors to kill him. Because for some reason, this makes him really sexy and really it makes him you know, just you know, turn into a great lover because he's in such a hurry to get out of there. So he's doing crazy stuff like that. Um, the book doesn't quite go anywhere. It, it, it's um, near the end. We start. He does a long reflections on some of the big influences on this these these writers and artists, such as Baudelaire, such as Poe. He talks quite a bit about them. He talks about one of my favorites, Flaubert. Uh, Flaubert is really interesting to me because it was he's he, he's so great in the bathtub. He's such a great writer and he's so enjoyable. And you can read sort of Madame Bovary. Which is sort of the real? We're talking about that kind of hyper realism where you feel like you're really in this this muggy bourgeois world. On the other hand, he writes Salambo, which is this exotic, over the top, violent, uh, hallucinogenic, uh, evil book, which is just beautifully written and is one of my favorite all time books. So uh, you, you you see in Flaubert and you, you really and Gautier, you really see these both of these uh, these interest as writers uh, coming into just fluorescence, you know, just coming very, uh, becoming efflorescent. Okay, so um, I think that's the most I wanted to say. The last question is, uh, we don't always ask this enough in the bathtub, is this worth taking into the bathtub? Because I, I frankly got a little bored with it the last 40, 50 pages and started to drift into some other things. And I say it is. It's definitely worth trying. It's not as great in the bathtub as Dracula, which is which is really Great, a great book in the bathtub, but it is really a beautiful book. It's beautifully written, and it's a really interesting book. Um, and I have to say, I, uh, I I'm glad I read it. I meant to read it for years and years, and only read bits of it. So I think I'm going to go out of here. Uh, I was going to try to play some Debussy. Okay, so anyway, I think that's it. I had a mango here. I tried to bring all sorts of sensual, beautiful stuff besides myself. And uh, there's nothing else to talk about. Ha uh, thank you for, for watching these. Uh, everyone who's watched it and not learned anything, I really appreciate it. And I'll try to not teach you anything. I'll continue. I'll try to do another hundred of these and try to teach you absolutely nothing if I possibly can. Right. And I'm pretty sure I can. <laughs>